When I was a kid, I was fascinated by many different things. You know, stuff like robots and dinosaurs. Yet there was one thing in particular that quite captivated me from early ages. Colors. That's right, I was mesmerized by colors, images, and whatever transparent that sparkled with light. As a boy, I had this little crystal collection that I obsessed over, so much so that I devised a plan to steal that piece from my grandma's chandelier. <laughs> of course, that didn't win very well, because that's like Mission Impossible when you're seven, and it's your mother's side, grandma, not your father's side, so obviously any diplomatic option is off the table. <laughs> Anyways, this fascination kept growing with me. This is a painting I did when I was 11. Of course, it doesn't look like a pretty painting, and it's really periodic because it's actually a hand-drawn 3D stereogram. When my poor mom first saw this, she was like, ha, huh, son, how many is this? And I was like, two? Then she started lecturing me about randomness in nature and weird things like that. <laughs> so moving on, anyways, moving on, I, I always had a lot of concepts that work with light. Concepts like photonic battery, a battery that uses photons, the particles of light instead of electrons, and thus can be charged up with a quick flash of light or just visualizing the invisible gases, just like this stream of air that I photographed. In recent years, though, I've focused on some types of mysterious radiation, radiation that some of us researchers even refer to as dark magic. Let me explain. You see, cell phones and satellite communications work with microwaves. That is, they send and receive electromagnetic signals within gigahertz frequency range. Your remote controller transmits infrared. Your TV shows images in the visible range where we can see right here from 400 terahertz to 800 terahertz. Higher than visible is ultraviolet or UV, which is what tans your skin in the beach. But right between these two is, is nothing. It's empty. You don't have anything right now that actually works within this range because this has been mostly dark to our, to our technology till recently. There has been very, that's actually where the title Dark Magic comes from. There has been very few controllable sources to radiate within this terahertz range. That is from 300 gigahertz to 3 terahertz. <clears throat> so just like the dog that is colorblind, our technology has been terahertz blind. And surprisingly, this missing piece has a lot of exciting organic applications. But why would you care? I mean, this is a TED talk, and I'm not supposed to come here and talk about my memories and excitements. Let's, let's get back to our melting planet where millions of people are dying every year just to cancer. In fact, World Health Organization said the number of cancer cases is estimated to increase to 21 million by 2030. 21 million. This is huge. I personally lost two of my dear relatives to cancer in the last couple of years. And I don't even want to bring up the negative effects that this has on our society because we all know it. However, if you look closer, some of... Some types of these cancers are much more common than the others. Obviously, the first one is lung cancer. Here's another graph from the same source. The blue bars are the incidence, and the red bars are, are the mortality. Well, we know that lung cancer is related to uh, the quality of the air that we breathe in and things like smoking. But what causes the other types of cancer? The truth is, a lot of these cancers are related, related to our own lifestyle and things that we do. <clears throat> it's a well-known fact that there's a strong connection between different types of cancer and things like smoking, drinking, and obesity. If that is the case, then why do we do this? Really? These are mentally rewarding and joyful to do at the moment. But another reason is that these arrows are questionable. This reminds me of one of my Italian friends. Whenever I, he smokes, whenever I ask him, why do you smoke, you might get lung cancer, he laughs at me and responds, well, there's only a chance I get lung cancer. However, there's a chance that I'm ran over by a car tomorrow morning, so, so why should I bother? You see, this might sound funny at first, but there's actually an interesting logic behind it. It's all about the chance. We don't have a crystal clear clue about the results of our action, and the results are rather gradual, so that's why we don't know where exactly to draw the lines. Maybe we're not going to be affected at all. Wouldn't it be great if we could somehow have a daily based feedback on our own health quality? I mean, how do we know if our smoking is actually starting a lung cancer? How do we know if we have been drinking too much? How do we know if we're just craving or we're actually hungry? Let's get into a bit more feminine problems. Take a look at cosmetics, for instance. It's over a $100 billion 
global industry, but it's actually a bit tricky. I mean, who knows if all these moisturizers actually help? How do I know what my skin needs at the first place? And for God's sake, are you tanning or are you actually starting your own cancer process? Fortunately, we think that dark piece of electromagnetic spectrum has some light to shed on most of these problems. But before I start talking about the terrorist technology and how it works, mm, cancer and cosmetics, that's not funny enough. You're young students, you want something cooler. Well, believe it or not, with terrorist technology, you can also see through clothing. Because it penetrates, because it penetrates a dry fabric and it is absorbed by the water content of your skin. So now you can imagine yourself as a superhero with terrorist sensitive eyes. Or maybe not. Anyways, now it's cool enough, so let's see how it works. So there are many different ways to generate and detect terrorist radiations. Here you can see a terrorist setup with a terrorist transmitter and a terahertz receiver. There are these tiny chips that we excite with a <coughs> short pulses of infrared, and then the terrorist is generated and detected uh, and focused with this weird white Teflon lens onto the receiver. So let's have a closer, closer look at these chips because these are at the very core of this technology. In fact, I have one of them with me right now. So here it is. Now, if you can't see the word TEDx, don't bother, because the chip is actually at, right at the dot of the word UVEC. Anyway, it's just a, it's a, it's just a tiny chip with some uh, micrometer-sized electrodes and gaff on it. And here's how it works. To generate terahertz, we charge up and illuminate this gap right in the middle of the chip. You can see with each incoming pulse, a terahertz pulse is generated at the other side. On the receiver side, the opposite happens. The terrorist is coming from the transmitter, and when we illuminate the gap, we can measure an electrical signal on the pads. So basically, these chips change the frequency of the light. It is as if you shine a blue beam of light onto a chip and see red light emitting from the other side. Now, it's somewhat cool that the transmitter and the receiver can be fabricated from this, with the same technology, but more exciting than that are these other factors that are entering the game. You see, the infrared pulses that I talked about aren't those emitted from your TV remote controllers. These are fancy, ultra-short laser pulses. And this is the laser that generates these things. We have had this for almost 10 years in our lab. And let me tell you, it's a big miss. You have a big chiller constantly humming down there. You have a giant control unit down here. Then you have a pump unit and an external cavity unit that you would have to tweak every single time you turn on the laser. It takes about half an hour to stabilize this $250,000 monster. But last year, something interesting happened. Replace all of that with a cute little black box. It fits into a bag and it does all the same thing, but with a lot less hassle and a lot less money. So essentially what's happening is that so essentially what happened to electronics industry is now happening to optical devices. These devices are getting more efficient, smaller, and cheaper. It's just an extension to the same miniaturization wave and it's real. In fact, it wouldn't be much of a surprise to see the whole terrorist system integrated into a mobile device like a cell phone in 10 to 20 years. This is because in parallel to miniaturization, other factors are boosting the performance of these devices. For electronics, it was the semiconductor technology that flourished the whole industry. But for photonics and these optical chips, it, it, is, it is the nanotechnology that is changing the game. Take a look at nanomaterials, for example. Instead of conventional materials, now we, now we are using nanomaterials like carbon nanotubes to enhance the efficiency of both detecting and emitting terahertz. Here's one of our samples that has carbon nanotubes deposited into the gap of the chip. You can literally see these carbon nanotubes between those electrodes in this microscope image. Now, another emerging trend is nanoplasmonics. Now, nanoplasmonics is just a fancy title for electrons dancing to the light in very small scales. What it does is that it lets the light leak into very small features. It's a very counterintuitive phenomenon, and it happens because at some specific sizes, the electrons at the, sur at the surface of the structure start to beat with the incident light. <clears throat> the images show one of our samples that uses the same principle to enhance the coupling of the optical beam with the substrate of the chip. 
the microscope is zooming from the left to the right, and you can see these nanometer sized interlaced fingers that are, that are connected to the electrodes. The electrodes are then connected to the larger pads that let, that let us charge up such small features. Now, even if you have a good terrorist transmitter and a terrorist detector, you still need to be able to guide the generated waves. Here's where the waveguides come into play. Just like water pipelines that guide the water into your house, waveguides guide the electromagnetic waves from the transmitter into the receiver. Here you can see one of our large-scale terrorist waveguides. It's a two-wire waveguide that stretches from the back of the transmitter to the receiver. Right in the middle, though, you can you can let the terrorist waves interact with whatever, whatever you want. Now, this can be a biological sample, it can be a terrorist sample, or in fact, it can be just your breath. Here you can see one of our experiments that we are trying to scan the breath with terrorist waves. Uh, there's that two-wire waveguide there, and we're essentially breathing on it. Now, we thought this is a bit big, so we would have to probably develop something more elegant. And that's why we're working on this smaller, compact version. Now, you can't see the micrometer size features in this image, but this is, in fact, a transmitter, a receiver, and a waveguide combined. It's about a centimeter long, and here's how it works. To generate terahertz, we charge up and illuminate this transmission site. Terahertz gets out, it gets mixed with the biological sample, and then we detect the signal at the other side. The signal typically looks something like this. Now, you might say, well, that's just a pulse. It's true, it's just a pulse, but this pulse has been distorted just a tiny bit by the sample it passed through. So when you analyze this pulse, you can see what frequency components were absorbed by the sample. And this way, you can talk about the chemical composition of the sample. Here's a short list of different compounds that can be detected this way, and here's where the magic happens. Look at this. Water, a lot of smoking-associated chemicals like HCN and CO, a lot of protein-related chemicals like glycine, glycerol, some disease-related compounds, and even some bacteria are present in that list, and the list goes on and on. So just like our tiny visible range where roses are red and violets are blue, in terahertz range, HCN is red and the glycine is blue. They're both invisible, but invisible to you. Ooh, that rhymes. <laughs> anyway, terrorist technology is giving us these new markers for de detecting different compounds and different diseases. It is as if you were able to see different diseases in different colors. This is what we needed to monitor our health with. You or your computer, this is Siri, can look at this signal and say, okay, this dip here means that you have a lot of HCN in your breath so you have been smoking too much. That dip over there means that you have been drinking too much. Same thing when you scan the skin. Your computer can look at the signal again and say, okay, that peak over there means <clears throat> you have some skin cancer agents present in your skin. And finally, those bumps over there means, please stop putting more cream on that cakey face. <laughs> Our business is painting with the invisibles. It is to see the colors we can't see without the science. So think about it. What color is your breath? Thank you.